Afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel from JP Equity Partners. Thanks for joining the Farmos webinar today. Um, as we're not doing a full page turn of a presentation, um, what I want to do for people attending the webinar today is outline what's been discussed in the previous quarterly uh, and what's in store for 2021. Um, I want to highlight the key points in the activity timeline um which i'll put over now so what's in store for 2021 with farm i just want to welcome roger richard and colin um, who will be answering your questions today um, so over to you quickly roger just to chat through the activity for for this year and what's in store and we have had a lot of questions come through already so I, I have got a few visual slides for everyone to relate to. Uh, Farmos is a very closely followed stock. So if you are unfamiliar with anything, we can, of course, answer stuff post this webinar. Um, welcome, Roger, in early in the UK. You just need to unmute, Roger. Right. Uh, so thank you, Daniel, and uh, thank you for setting up the, uh, the day for us with the Q&A. Um, look, I, I think uh, we're entering uh, a new phase with Pharmos, and I think uh, it's an exciting phase. Uh, we're uh, setting up now for three key areas of research and development, which is cancer, COVID, and viral disease, and of course, the recent grant from MND, motor neuron disease. So exciting times, and uh, we've got a trial running at the moment, which we hope will trigger some of the uh, the milestones that uh, are in the uh, in the in the half year, in the quarterly. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, we have had hundreds of questions come through. I will put up related slides um, with some of the questions, and we can go from there. Now. I'll just start with you, Richard. Um, one of the main questions that's come through so far is, can you please update us on the phase 2B dog trial announced on the 22nd of December, um, including compassionate treatments? Okay, thank you, Dan, for the question. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. I'll start, I guess, with compassionate use because we get a lot of questions around that. And it's been very interesting. Since we announced this trial, we've been getting a lot of interest from compassionate use. So this is because we have strict inclusion exclusion criteria for the trial. So a lot of dogs may have had prednisolone before. And of course, we're treating dogs that are treatment naive in this trial, or dogs may not have the full life expectancy to get through the trial. And we see it as our social responsibility to help out with us. So we offer the tablets through compassionate use. And this does not affect our supply of tablets. We've ensured we've got more than enough for the ongoing trial. And it helps far most because it gives vets familiarity with the drug. So the fact that it's being requested so much is very encouraging for us because we consider that as a signal that vets think that it's a good drug. But we don't have any data and we can't solicit any data from pet owners using it because it's their private affairs. And I mean, it's a very difficult issue to get involved in. And we're always asking, or we're always asked, you know, how long have they been for and so forth. But, we can't ring up and ask because, say, for example, their dog was killed by a car the day before. It would be extremely insensitive and it's just not our business. But we do our social responsibility and give the drug and hope for anecdotal reports. And often we get reports that the dogs are very happy and they're doing well. And that's about the best we have. Yep. Um, with the clinical trial, which is the more important part of the question, yeah, that's coming along very well. So we started in December and we're targeting a lower dose than the original trial we started, well, that was in December 2019 and finished in April, I think, last year. And the reason for this is that even though all dogs were getting a relatively high dose, where we thought high dose maximum cancer activity, 
the blood levels vary quite significantly in the dogs. And we had to understand why this was happening. And we went back and um, analysed all of the safety data. And we found also unexpectedly that the dogs at high blood levels had some inappetence, which was extremely unexpected. Um, we found that the dogs with the low blood levels did not have any inappetence. So we'd never seen this before. We hadn't seen it in any of the safety data, even when they were administering more than 10 times what we were administering. And unfortunately, it's all under the, well, the confidentiality agreement of the toxicology report, but I can't share the reasons, but we have got very good ideas why this was happening. We find that at the lower blood levels, we get very good anti-cancer activity. And this was the dog who had the best response with some lesions disappearing and greater than 60% reduction. This dog, in fact, had the lowest blood levels and no inappetence. So we're now targeting these lower blood levels. We're ensuring that we can meet these blood levels more accurately and we'll be happy to bring the data to the shareholders when we have some, uh, some significance of what's going on. Yeah, okay. And so obviously a big sort of following question with this is recruitment rates. Um, got a slide here. How are, how are recruitment rates um, traveling? Obviously there are specific specifications. Yeah, so as you can see from this slide, there are two additional sites from the original trial last year. So in Underwood in Brisbane and in Osborne Park in Perth. So we had five sites last year. Um, the two that are not here are the university sites. And the only reason for this is just because of the holiday break and the university ethics committees who have different holiday breaks, et cetera, over the Christmas period. And I understand they'll all be coming back at the end of February, so they'll be able to um, assess the new dosing for the trial. We don't expect any problems with that. And hopefully those two new sites will come on board quite quickly, which mean we'll have seven again. So we expect the rates will be better than last time. We were impacted by shutdowns with COVID-19, where lots of veterinary clinics weren't able to recruit because vets or owners weren't allowed to bring their dogs in. Also, the vets have a greater familiarity with the drug now as well, and they understand how to administer it better, and they also have better confidence. So yeah, we're expecting better rates, and things are going pretty well so far. Great to hear. Um just on clinical trials, um, a big question we've received and investors are keen to get an update on the manufacturer of GMP grade Monopantel uh, for human clinical trials. I think you're probably best place to answer this, Richard, as well. Yes. So thanks, Dan. I think that's a good question too. So the Monopantel and tablets we have at the moment are strictly for veterinary use. And that's what they're being imported for. So now we're making monopantil for human use. So it, it takes some time to make monopantil and everything's going well. I mean, we have our original timeline scaled out and we're expecting to see tablets manufactured by the end of the year. We have had word from the manufacturers that it's difficult sometimes to get raw materials. So there's been maybe a couple of weeks delay in sourcing one of the key compounds, but they're confident they can make up that time with other activities. So we're pretty minimally impact. Um, these supply chain contingencies are really due to COVID-19 as well. And they're globally, every company around the world is being affected by them because, for example, the workers can't get into the um, facility to make the raw material, they have to still have to buy materials as well into their facility. Shipping is restricted. People aren't stockpiling because they don't know what other people's demands are. So there are challenges at the moment with COVID-19, but we're confident we should be able to meet these um, our schedules and we'll keep everybody updated, of course. 
Perfect. Thanks for that. Now, just just with the human can, uh, cancer trial, have you submitted regulatory approvals um, with the hope to commence that trial? Not on? as yet for the human cancer trial. So our strategy is currently to start with the fight MND trial. And so we're preparing the documentation for that. We're also preparing the documentation for the human cancer trial and also for a COVID-19 trial. So there isn't a pressing need to have that submitted right now, but we will commence submissions for these human research ethics committee in the next couple of months. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. Um, Welcome back, Roger. Has there been any engagement with veterinary pharmaceutical companies um, re regarding licensing opportunities now that you're free to talk to other vet majors? Yes, I mean, in addition to the, the vet major with which we had an option, uh, we, we have opened up some dialogue with third parties. But as vet major said, what they wanted to see was uh, more uh, complete regression or um, extensive regression of tumors in dogs. Just by way of reminder, we had a combination of stable disease or regression. And um, that ratio between stable disease and, and, and complete regression, I guess, is what affects what a partner is going to pay you at the end of the day. So <clears throat> we're um, very keen to complete this trial in dogs that's currently running. Uh, with the expectation that we will get more regression. And if that is the case, we're confident we can open the door and negotiate hard for the best deal for the shareholders. Perfect. That sounds good to hear that you can be out in the market now. Um, just on that, uh, I've got a general commercial question for yourself, Roger. Um, do farmers have any updates on their view as to the addressable market size for MPL? Um, is addressing as a whole or per main indication, what are the size of the prizes um, that we now view as achievable? The, <coughs> the excuse me, the, um, the, the short answer is that um, the vet market is lower and faster to commercialization. Uh, for cancer, that's between five and six hundred million dollars a year. And typically, um, a vet major uh, getting into the cancer market would be expected to pull in something of the order of about 150 million. That would be a good market share for cancer for a vet major. And of course, we would then get a, a clip, a percentage of that, which <clears throat> if we estimate 10%, uh, shareholders can easily do a calculation of what the annual income would be without a cost base. Um, with humans, it's a different story. The, by way of example, if you can show stable disease uh, for an additional eight to 12 weeks in uh, patients, that's a billion dollar drug. And there are drugs out there offering that small advantage. As long as the quality of life is good, then the, the, the market really is very, very large. So strategy is let's get the dogs done um, and partner and then focus on the human trial, as Richard was just explaining a moment ago, in terms of a rollout. Cool, thanks a lot. Um, Richard, just back on the manufacturing side of things, uh, we've got a question here around the timeline. Uh, how, how long does it actually take to produce 10 kilos of Monopantel, given the roadmap says Q1 to three. Now you did elaborate a little on that at the start. If we could just maybe break that down again. Yeah, sure. And that's a great question. And it relates to Roger's comment about rollout. So we can't go into the clinic until for any disease until we have tablets and we can't make tablets until we have Monopantel. So what happens is the, our company in India who's making Monopantil, they made, they did a fantastic job. They made 100 grams for us earlier just in a um, demonstration batch, which we reported on, I think that was in 2019 or 18. And that was always our backup 
for our whole pipeline for amino acid or nitrile derivatives. So they've given us the capability to scale the whole amino acid or nitrile derivative suite to GMP grade for use in clinical trials. So now they're using that to make more monopantal for these research and development activities in these clinical trials. So what happens is they have to order the raw materials. And as we discussed, that can take some time. So that might take two months, for example. Then they have to do a feasibility scale manufacture. So this is taking 100 grams to 10 kilograms where they use different machinery. So like larger scale machinery, all of this needs optimization. And this would be non-GMP because it takes a lot of work to do a GMP patch. It takes a lot of work to do feasibility. So it's a reiterative process. Once they've scaled for their feasibility studies, then they have to do method transfer to their GMP suite. So it's like, I don't know, cooking something in the kitchen. You've got to tell your friends how to cook it. So there's a progress to move it to the new suite. Then they manufacture and the manufacturing of the GMP monopantle might take five or six weeks, for example, itself. But you have all of these build up activities. Then after it's made, you have to assess it, like the physical characteristics, the chemical characteristics, the purity of it. You have to do stability studies on it. And then you can give it to Catalan to make a tablet. Then the tablet that we're making with Catalan is actually smaller than the one we made before, because we think the dose we might need for motor neuron disease, for example, should be a bit smaller. So this means they have to do feasibility tests again. They have to do dissolution experiments to make sure everything works out okay. And then they have to do um, stability studies for the tablet as well. So this is what I was speaking about earlier as well with the Human Research Ethics Committee and regulatory approvals. If we get these submitted March, April, we've still got plenty of time before presumably August, September, October, when we're thinking really about the clinical trial start time. So it's just getting all of these components in place. Yeah, okay. And just on, we've got one question here, Richard, I'm working you overtime, but um, could you elaborate just a bit on yesterday's announcement um, with what's happening with the leading investigation? Um, yeah. Okay, so Leiden University Medical Centre are testing the effects of monopantol against um, the coronavirus and COVID-19. So this is on the back of the preclinical work we've ever done or we've already done, which has shown that it does have an effect. However, we're looking to prepare ourselves for clinical trials, of course. So we want the greatest body of evidence possible so that we can go to clinicians and say, can you try monopantal? So you might imagine there are thousands of drugs trying to get into the market at the moment and we'll have tablets ready by the end of the year. So we're just building our evidence base. So by the end of the year, we're in the best possible position to move directly into clinical trials. With um, commercialization from the Leiden data, we probably don't expect to commercialise based on preclinical data, but that would be a board and shareholder decision, I would suggest. But usually the further you can go along the development chain, the more valuable it is. So, you know, we could go from cells in addition, try to sell it to a partner, or we could go to a phase one, phase two trial, and then try to get a commercialisation agreement. And Pharmost is in a very good position to conduct phase two trials. So keeping it in-house until that point might be a good strategic way forward to get a maximum value, but yeah, that'll be a question for the board to decide as we go along. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that was just sort of answer the question I had that just popped up um, about next steps towards commercialisation. But um, yeah, th thanks a lot for going into that. Um, you're in a good position there. Um, Roger? Uh, we've just had a few questions as well um, who where investors want an update on Europe and US companies regarding COVID-19 clinical evaluation humans. 
Well, I mean, we're in the COVID-19 area and we've done a couple of studies which gave um, uh, good results, over 90% uh, inhibition of viral growth. So we think that, uh, you know, the strategy to go into viral disease is, is a good one. We um, are in the process now of preparing offer documents, if you like, short five pages, which we share with uh, companies to uh, arouse their interest, if you like, in what we're doing and uh, the, the prospects of using MPL in, uh, in patients. Um, and of course, this is partly what we were doing with the Dutch group, the Leiden group, in that they were uh, uh, going to test and repeat some of the work that's already been done, but also um, go to the next step and do what we call organoid work, where they use human tissues as opposed to just cells. And um, this is an important step, which is why we're frustrated a little bit about the delays in Holland. Um, but I think we'll get there. And once we have the organoid work, I think this will be very attractive, assuming it works, very attractive for um, moving into man. Okay, th thanks for that. Um, Richard, we've just got a pretty direct one here, and this is also on the activity timeline um, that you, that's been announced. Um, the results for the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Research Institute preclinical uh, investigations, when are they expected? Okay, so we have an agreement with them where we would expect them to give all of the data after about 12 months, but we, we're sympathetic to the fact that sometimes coronavirus shuts down laboratories and they can't get into the laboratory. So if it takes a bit longer, that's okay. But with that being said, they've already delivered some fantastic data and really helped us understand how monopantil is working and the specificity towards diseased cells rather than non-diseased cells. So we announced the RNA sequencing work where they did. And so this is where they add monopantil to cell cancer cells in culture and also non-cancer cells in culture. And we look at globally every gene in the cell, how it's switched on and switched off. And then by looking at three different cancer cell lines, for example, we see overlapping um, subsets and comparing that to what's happening in normal cells where really not much was happening at all in respect to changes in gene expression, which was really a fantastic outcome in itself because it um, confirms what we've always demonstrated that it really is having less of an effect on normal cells and it's only really disease cells that it's acting on. So we're interrogating these changes in genes and we're picking a few of them out and looking at specifics of how these genes are affecting the cells. We're also looking at trying to dissect what happens once monopantal hits the cell, like from the receptor and the protein cascades that follow through onto gene expression studies. So we're, we're looking at the whole time frame from when monopantal finds a cell to what happens to the cell in cell death afterwards. And they're you know, extremely intense experiments. And I think the Olivia Newton-John Kent's Research Institute is doing a very good job with this. Perfect. Um, one for you here, Roger. Um, do, do you have a, an update on discussions with European oncologists regarding the prospect of undertaking controls? I didn't catch all of that, Daniel. You broke up, but I think That's I got right. the gist of it. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, we. Are there any updates have, on European oncologists' discussions? Yeah. Well, uh, we have met with uh, oncologists in the UK and uh, Europe. There's two of them, one's in Italy, one's in the UK. And they have both expressed an interest in participating or basically running a clinical trial in humans. Um, where we are at the moment, of course, is uh, optimizing uh, the dosage, the tablets. Uh, the canine study that's currently running will give us a, uh, also pointers as to how much we should use. So when we go back to them, we want to be able to go back with a protocol to say, look, this is what we would recommend to, to, uh, to dose the patients with. And of course, what stage of patients are you going to use? Are you going to use uh, patients that have failed standard of care or are you going to use upfront therapy before they've had anything else? All these questions must be answered. And uh, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're in the process of preparing 
again, what we'd call a, a teaser or offer document, which will go to these oncologists to, uh, to read and review and um, decide how they want to do it. Yeah, okay. Um, just, I'm just gonna move along to the M&D grants that the company has received, because we've got quite a few questions on that. Um, Richard, can, can we get a little more insight to the road ahead to get to human trials, such as key deliverables and timing, other, uh, you know, taking out pill manufacturing? Um, yeah. Has the company received any money from Fight M&D yet? Okay, so Fight MND were under contractual agreement for eight hundred and eighty thousand dollars. So there's no trouble with that. I'm calling Fight MND all the time to give them updates. They're happy with how we're tracking, so everything's fine. Um, with key deliverables other than pill manufacturing, there are really none. It's quite interesting. We've done all of the hard work. Um, of course, we have to submit to Human Research Ethics Committee, but we've already submitted with Zolvix Monopantel to a Human Research Ethics Committee. We have pharmacokinetics from this, and we have safety data from Monopantel and humans. We have safety data from dogs. We have safety data from rats. We have all sorts of data. So we're reasonably confident that that's going to be fine. So, I mean, that might be the only sticking point, but I would suggest any question they ask will be able to answer quite readily given the body of evidence we have. Um, we are ready to go into trial. We've spoken to the clinicians, we've decided on dosing. We've, with regard to that body of evidence, we've looked at Zolvix Monopantil in dogs and tablets in dogs. We've looked at Zolvix Monopantil in rats and tablets in rats. We've looked at Zolvix in humans, so we can make very good extrapolations from all of those studies, what dose we should be giving in humans with the tablet. So a lot of the key deliverables have already been done. Yeah, okay. Is he, and so the intention to run phase one and phase two parallel um, commencing in Q4? Okay, so that's an ongoing discussion I'm having with the board. So with the fight MND, strictly it should be phase one, phase two, because it'll be first in human with the tablets, and we really want to see what dose we're going to get. But we will be looking at measures of efficacy. So it would be a phase one rolling into phase two, all concomitant. Um, with that data, with the first tablet data, knowing what blood levels are delivered is fantastic for phase two trial in cancer. I don't see a need to do a phase one for cancer, and I don't see a need to do um, pure phase one for COVID-19. They might say, look, you've got to prove that it's safe because patients will have different um, medical condition and they may be more susceptible to different doses. But I suspect cancer will be straight away phase two, motor neuron disease and COVID will be overlapping one, two. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Um, Colin over at Epicam, just got a, a question here in, in relation to the e-waste grant um, that you have received. Um, what are the target metals you're expecting to liberate from processing e-waste and how lucrative could that be if successful? Uh, thanks, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for your generous time. So um, some of the target metals that we that we hope to liberate from the OHD flow reactor technology are things like copper, tin, lead, gold, and platinum, to name a few, including things like rare earth metals. So I think there's an opportunity, rare earth metals, the government has just released through their Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, a, um, a paper termed Australia's Critical Mineral Strategy 2019. Um, and some of those in that document have actually outlined some of the rare earth metals that they're looking at focusing on, which some of them are the ones that we think that we could extract from our technology, um, potentially focused at two major areas of defence and then reuse in electrical and electronic equipment. Um, so that's, that's, that's a very exciting space for Epigen moving forward. 
it's certainly a topic um, conversation in the world right now, isn't it? Um, still on yourself, Colin, um, do it just in relation to this exact question. Do, do Epicam have any rights to the IP generated as a result of work being done on e-waste uh, for the WA government? So, so the short answer is yes. So, so what, what this grant allows us to do is to build a benchtop flow reactor here in the Epicam laboratory as, as the first starting point, and then to test a series of biomass and feedstock in that, uh, in that flow reactor. Now, all of the all of the non all of the non-organic or inorganic uh, or metals um, is is an opportunity for Epicam to own intellectual property. And we've also also um, coined a term already called oxidative hydrothermal mineral extraction that we will then use to, have, to actually look at specific mineral extraction moving forward as well. So, um, so, 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 so that's an exciting um, exciting opportunity for the company. Great. Uh, another Epicam one for yourself, Colin. Um, how, how are the budgets tracking this year? Uh, are, you, are you guys on track for profitability again? So uh, forecasting is on track and looking promising. We expect to deliver a, profit, a profitability, um, on an improvement or increase um, above 20, 2020. Some exciting things um, that are happening. Obviously, we, we've secured the DNDI contract for a 13th, 13th consecutive year. Also, with the introduction of the OHD technology, there's an opportunity is now presented for us to enter into a direct sub-license agreement. Uh, from that perspective, and we and we're just talking through and negotiating um, that discussion as we speak. The 200k um, waste sorted waste grant gives us a great opportunity, as I mentioned, not only to build the bench top flow reactor, but then to de dedicate chemists to that project um, to identify a series of, of feedstock and biomass, um, including things like plastics, rubber tires, um, conversion of you know, of, of you know. Coal, for example, into a series of valuable end user products and so forth. Um, so yeah, so so look, you know, I'm very proud of where we're at and what we've achieved thus far in sometimes challenging circumstances over the last 12 months with, with the COVID pandemic. But we've uh, we look like we can we'll come out the other end and still be very much focused on our strategy. Right, sounds sounds really good. Um, now this this question is, I guess, across Richard and yourself, Colin. Um, and clearing up a bit of confusion, we've had it a couple of times today, this question. Have Epicam produced MPL or could it? Um, I'm happy to answer that question and Richard can, can add as he sees fit. Yeah. Um, the answer is we, we, we have pr produced monopental and, and we can produce it, but only for non-human for, for non trials. Okay. From that perspective, so so for, for us, anything that any manufacturer that, that involves non-human capability is well within Epicam's remit. Yeah, is it? Can you expand on that, uh, Rich? Oh, sure. So, when with non-human use, people might say, "Well, why don't you make it for dogs?" Right. So, with the APBMA, you have to manufacture the GNP if you can. And we clearly can, and we think it's in the best interests of the dogs, the owners, the whole research program to do everything to GMP. So although we could ask Epichem to ramp up and see if they would manufacture us 10 kilograms of monopantal, um, at the moment, it, it makes more sense to have that done where there are already facilities capable of doing that to GMP. Uh, Epicam has made us some very good monopantal in the past for our research, and we have been using that, and we've been extremely happy with that. Perfect. Um, just sort of rounding it out, because we've, we've been quite broad. Um, just with the activities Farmos currently undertaking, I assume that they're eligible for R&D? Yeah, so that's a good financing question. And as always, when we undertake any activity, we do diligence on several providers to see where we can get the best value for money. So, of course, if you manufacture overseas and the capability is not in Australia, you're eligible for the R&D tax rebate. Anything you do in Australia, you're eligible for the R&D tax rebate. 
Sometimes there might become a situation where an overseas company has better experience or even offers a lower price based on an Australian price, even after R&D tax rebate. So we do our diligence in this. We're getting the best value for shareholders in that respect. It's going to be a busy time for farmers. So I just want to thank everyone for logging in today and listening. Um, please shoot through any further questions and we, we can get back to you as soon as we can um, if we haven't covered anything that was unanswered. Um, thanks a lot, Colin, Richard and Roger.